Hey guys, how's it going? And happy Friday. I hope all of you guys are doing good. I was just sitting here enjoying the chat for a few minutes, trying to calm down for the live stream. And yes, I literally was mowing grass at the property here I rent, drove my lawnmower within a few feet of the door, got off of it, and came in here. So a couple of you guys were speculating on that, and I think our friend Endit had it pretty darn close. Thanks for being a channel supporter, by the way, man. And I'd like to thank all of you guys who support this channel. If you guys haven't noticed, I don't even run ads like while these are live. Sometimes on replay, sometimes not. And I also don't sit there and do paid sponsorship bets. You guys are my sponsors. That's why I talk about whatever I want on this channel. They don't tell me I have to take this hat off. They don't tell me that I have to do a positive review. I can be myself, and that's because of all of you. So I really appreciate you guys. Just being here and hanging out, that offers me encouragement, helps the channel grow. I really appreciate that. Also, it costs a lot of money to run a gun channel. So I just want to thank all my Patreon supporters, channel members, those of you who leave generous super chats, it all goes back into the channel, and that's why I'm able to still physically keep doing this. Also, all the supporters on Locals. And I know I talk about my Locals community a lot, but I'm telling you guys, it's a whole separate community in and of itself. A lot of the people are the same, but here's the difference. When we're here on YouTube, it's called Susan Wiki Wiki. Hi, Susan. She's a real beauty in a different kind of way, but there's lots of rules. Like, I can't touch guns and live streams. Over on Locals, I can. I did 10 live streams last month and touched guns in at least nine of them, if not all of them. I also put up three standalone videos over there and also did a giveaway. So go check it out. I'm going to be streaming there tomorrow night at around 9.30 p.m. Eastern time or so, maybe 10 o'clock. Depends when I'm done working. And I think I'm going to talk about Taurus guns over there. I just want to get a big pile of them next to me and kind of go through the whole evolution of the Taurus G series. So if that's something you guys look forward to, we'll be doing that over on Locals. I also have more videos planned here for YouTube. And I was sitting here thinking here, hmm, why is it? And we think about this a lot and we should think about it. Why is it that we have 24,000 plus federal gun regulations and gun laws when the Second Amendment literally says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed? And that's actually the supreme law of the land, the Constitution as amended. You know, when we say we want to be rule of law, that is being rule of law. And any law that would be contrary to that is actually an illegal law, in my opinion. But not just in my opinion, because you can look at the very early, one of the first United States Supreme Court cases in Marbury v. Madison. All laws that are repugnant to the Constitution are null, they're void, and they're not a legitimate law. Now, we have something written down on a piece of paper a long time ago, and it's a beautiful document. It's called the Bill of Rights that actually doesn't grant you any rights at all. Hold on a minute. Somebody's sitting there thinking of themselves. I know at least one person. Hold on a minute. So the Second Amendment doesn't grant me the right to keep in bear arms? No, it doesn't, but that's actually a beautiful thing. That's the beautiful thing that this country was founded upon. See? All rights are endowed to you by your creator. These are laws of nature and of nature's God. And that was literally talked about in the very initial founding document, the Declaration of Independence. Now, I talked about that document in a video that I did a little less than a week ago on Independence Day, July 4th. And I'm glad I did that video. And I know some of you guys liked it. Now, also, I would note it was practically the least viewed video I've done in a long time. I don't think a lot of people care about the Declaration of Independence too much anymore. And I know people care about the Second Amendment. They like to read the words that were written down. But again, it's just words on a piece of paper. If there's not we the people to stand up for them, to fight for them in many, many different ways. Now, repeal the NFA. We've been talking about that a lot. And I don't know exactly what's going to happen in the courts, but there might be a prospective chance of that happening soon. And we're going to talk about this court case. And we should be encouraged. Bruin was a big win in the Supreme Court, okay? Meaning it could have been a lot worse. 
But it still never said that all gun control is unconstitutional, did it? It never even acknowledged repealing the National Firearms Act, which is the supreme law of the gun control land. I'm saying that in air quotes for those of you listening, because back to the founding of this country, if this is repugnant to the Constitution, which clearly, obviously it is in so many ways, not just the Second Amendment, but for many other reasons, the National Firearms Act is completely and utterly unconstitutional. And I get most of my motivation from the founding documents. And I've realized this for a long time. And I think a lot of you guys do too. You know, I'm going to quote somebody else. This was Andrew Breitbart who originally said this, but it's important and he's not alive to keep saying it. So I'm going to. Politics is downstream from culture. We're in some sort of civil war right now, guys. We're in some sort of revolution right now. It's obvious to me, but it's a cultural one. Some people think that's not enough. Other people would hope it would stay at that. And I know there's many different opinions on both sides and on the fringes of those two concepts. But the American people need to finally realize once and for all what our rights are, what our rights come from. And the fact that the Second Amendment did not grant you your rights. In fact, it's not written to you at all. It's written to the government. Literally read. Literally read the Second Amendment. Now, if you want to, you can think it was written to you, and that's good, but I'm actually trying to offer you something more encouraging than that. It actually wasn't written to you at all. It was written to the government. And it didn't just say what. It said why. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Now, that part was written to you. That part, I think, is kind of letting us know. If we don't have a well-regulated militia, and that doesn't mean regulations like onerous restrictions like how we would use the word today, no, that means it's at the ready and it's able to actually accomplish something, to put it very bluntly. Okay, the second part. This was written to the federal government of the United States of America. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. That's why. Now, here's the what. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. They were literally telling themselves, that government and all future governments, that you shall not infringe. Now, shall that shall not has very, very specific legal meaning. That means it's an edict. That means it's doctrine. That means it's a direct order. That means it's a lawful order. And it's actually the most lawful order that there is on the books. Being amendment to the United States Constitution, being the supreme law of the land, you only have to go like three very simple steps of logical deduction to realize that's exactly what it is. The Declaration of Independence talks about where your rights come from. It talks about how a government would have its authority. It would talk about how the government literally was only created to protect your natural rights that were endowed by your creator and that it would only be able to operate at the consent of the governed. And yes, we need to repeal the NFA and repealing it in the courts would be a great victory. But the ultimate victory, in my opinion, would be to win it there while simultaneously winning in the court of public opinion. And I truly think that the court of public opinion matters. And that's why all of you guys matter. And that's why I do these streams every week. Because none of us are on the Supreme Court. And quite frankly, we never will be. Now, there's a few more federal judges out there. There's a possibility a federal judge watches my streams. But probably not. So probably nobody listening right now is a federal judge. And you probably never will be either. But there's literally like less than two handfuls of people that sit on the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court, okay? And then you go down to federal judges that serve in the federal appeals system. Okay, there might be a couple hundred of those. Federal judges, period, maybe a couple thousand, and I'm talking in the whole federal judiciary system. Hmm. But there's about 330 to 350 million of the rest of us And if people just acknowledge just a little bit the power they have, the authority they have, because all the power is supposed to be inherent in the people, and the government has no rights and literally only exists to protect your rights. I'm being dead serious. From enemies that are foreign 
and domestic, that's when we can truly, truly win this war. So I want to be excited about Supreme Court cases that have been recently won, if you will. I also want to talk about uh, pending litigation in the federal courts that might actually be a win in and of itself. But what I really would like these court cases to do is to provide the inspiration and motivation for people to tell the government, no, you don't have our consent for this anymore. We just want to be left alone. And that's what most of you want. But you can't just sit there and only be left alone because then people will take that as a weakness. And I'm not telling you to be a mean person, but often just complacency and just being quiet is taken as the consent of the governed. So we can blame the government all we want. And there's many things to blame the government for, clearly. But if you realize that this government only operates at the consent of the governed, we really need to look no further than we the people ourselves. Now, I'm sure that most of the people watching this stream tonight, you're probably not part of the complacent crowd, and I get all that. But I'm just trying to provide you some motivation that a lot of the people you know in your life probably are. It's not that most people in the United States are anti-American. It's not even that most people hate the protections that the Second Amendment gives the people against the government. It doesn't give you the right. It protects you from the government infringing. I don't think it's that the majority of the people in the country hate that either, actually, believe it or not. And I don't think most people in this country are for gun control necessarily. I mean, to different extents. No, I think there's a lot of people who just don't care. And there's some people that are going to be tough to argue with. If you want the challenge, go for it. If you're young and spry and want to, look, argue with whoever you want. But there might be some people that you're never going to change their mind. I mean, you can dedicate your resources to them if you want or not. You do you. But there's probably a lot of people right within your inner circle that just don't care. And they just don't know. And they don't even know what the National Firearms Act is. Now, the National Firearms Act, literally one of the most draconian things ever written because it's a violation of rights. It's a violation of human rights. It's a violation of civil rights. And JDV3 just mentioned, he says, hey, thanks for being a channel member and thanks for the super chat. He says, hey, seeing the left have a meltdown is priceless. Hey, man, if that gives you energy, that's awesome. And they laugh at us every time they have a perceived victory. So I, I totally, totally get it. But there's a lot of people too, right, that aren't necessarily of the left that sit there and are like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, there's gun control and stuff. I don't care. I don't know. What's the National Firearms Act? Well, here's something to remind people. And I again, somebody that's super, super radical that wants to just completely tear down the United States of America, wants to go straight communism, wants to go straight whatever, I get it. They're not going to like any of this because there are some people in this country that literally hate America. They'll tell you so themselves. You don't have to take my word for it. But then for all the people out there that are just thinking to themselves, well, I love America, but I don't have time to keep track of politics, they'll call it. Even though what I'm talking about right now really isn't truly politics. I'm not talking about a particular candidate because when you come to that, it's usually just two sides of the same coin. One wants to take as many of your rights away as quick as possible. The other in their speeches to get votes will tell you, right? They'll tell you that they want to protect the second amendment. They'll tell you they want to prohibit the government from infringing until you elect them. And then they'll either vote for gun control themselves as the dozens of Republicans just did between the house and Senate just a couple of weeks ago, or they'll just say, slow down Democrats, just a little bit less. Don't take them all away right now. We still need something to campaign on. And then that's actually where the Democrats will agree. I'm being dead serious. I know for a fact this is how this works with all of these campaign issues. The Republicans say, well, we can't ban them all because once they're all banned, then we can't run on being pro-gun. And then the Democrats actually kind of agree. And they say, well, we're going to ban them all eventually, but we can't ban them all before the next election because we need to run on trying to ban them all. And they play good cop, bad cop, and they go back and forth. And meanwhile, all of us end up being the butt of the joke. All of us that do know what's going on. This is why we need to get more people involved. Because there's other people that are the butt of this joke and don't even know what's going on. 
And the National Firearms Act, yes, it's gun related. Like, obviously, it's gun related. It's the chief and the way they look at it, the other side, whatever you want to call them. The other side doesn't just mean politically. I'm not just talking Democrat, Republican. I'm just talking like the other side, the people that want, you know, authoritarian leaders, the authoritarian leaders themselves, the rest of the world, much of the rest of the world, keep in mind, wants to alter our policies and alter our laws. So the other side means like, Many, many things, but I just shorten it to that because I think you guys know what I mean. Yes, it's about guns. Of course it's about guns, but it's actually about something completely different. And we need to think about that. It's actually a federal statute that has somehow been allowed to stand. Somehow, I guess by all of us, I'll take a very small portion of that. I'll take one three hundred and, you know, 50 millionth of that on my shoulders because I am a person. I am in the United States and you guys get my point, right? I'm not saying to put it all on your shoulders, but I guess we all have to take one 350 million at the very least, but we might know a bunch of people. So we should probably take the responsibility to educate a few more. It is literally a tax, the national firearms act. It is a tax on a natural right that was endowed to you by your creator. That's what the founding fathers said on the Declaration of Independence. And a right that is protected, a natural right, the right of the people, meaning it already existed before the Second Amendment was written in 1791, shall not be infringed. Now, if that's not something that's a constitutionally protected, enumerated right, then what the heck would be? Just think about that. Now, of course, we should focus on you know, what is a short-barreled rifle and why you should be able to have it and a short-barreled shotgun and a silencer, muffler, moderator, and why that's very useful for many reasons and a machine gun. And we will talk about that as this stream goes on. But maybe think about the other part of it. And if you can't quite connect with somebody on the gun part of things, which you should, but sometimes you can't, think about that. It is literally enumerated just as clear as day as the First Amendment is. That Congress shall, they shall not establish a religion. They shall not pass any laws that are going to encroach or infringe on your freedom of speech, to assemble, to petition the government for redress of grievance, all of these things. Now, we have taxes on some of those, too, and we need to work on that. I don't think you should need to pay for a permit to speak in public. But there's actually nothing in the Constitution that allows whatsoever to tax a fundamental right. And this has also been established, not only in the founding documents, but there was a lawsuit much, much later that was decided you can't have a poll tax. You can't tax someone to vote. Now, here's something you guys could mention to somebody when they say, well, hold on a minute. It's just a gun. It's just whatever. No, no, no. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's enumerated just as much. It's enumerated right there on paper just as much as your right to vote is also in the Constitution. You could just say something, say in your own way, but could you imagine looking at a friend that was kind of like, yeah, <clears throat> I'm pro-gun, I've got my shotgun, I've got my Glock, okay? But eh, you don't need a machine gun. You don't need a suppressor, silencer, whatever they want to call it. I was using the word silencer, moderator, muffler earlier because we're talking about the National Firearms Act, and that is legally what it is. People nowadays like to call them suppressors. Call it whatever you want. But if they're like, well, you don't really need that. That's from, it's like, well, really? Just look at them and say, do you need to vote? Now, that might be an ironic answer. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of people say, I don't vote. I don't even know what that is. But do you need to vote? As soon as you tell them they don't need to, then they're going to say, well, yeah, I can vote if I want. Even though they might never vote a day in their life, whatever. As soon as you tell them, well, I don't think you need to vote. They're going to look at you and say, excuse me? I'm an American. America, we can vote. Um, America, the right to keep and bear them shall not be infringed. And then ask them, would you be okay with a $200 tax? Now, if you want to vote in the primary, that's 200 bucks. But that's not enough. When you get in there, if you want to vote for your county commissioner, that's an extra 200 bucks. You want to vote for township supervisor? That's an extra 200 bucks. The board of regents for the U of M University I don't even know who these people are, but hold on. You can vote for no more than three. It's usually something like that, right? For Board of Regents, vote for no more than three. Well, that's 600 bucks if you want to vote for three of those. Okay. 
You want to vote for somebody, the county commissioner? All right, $200 more. Just think about that. Because the National Firearms Act doesn't just say $200 and you can buy as many National Firearms Act qualified firearms as possible. No, no, no. It's actually $200 each. Yeah. So another 200 bucks for your state rep, another 200 bucks for your state senator, governor, 200 bucks, right? Now your national senator, every three election cycles, 200 more bucks, president of the United States. Every other time, another 200 bucks. And in some cases, guys, it's actually on the ballot, the former vice president of the United States. Let's go Brandon, by the way. 200 bucks. Who wants to give 200 bucks to, to vote for Brandon? Think about it. The most popular, the most fortified of all time, according to NewsGuard certified sources, Susan Wiki Wiki. Okay. Now, hold on a minute. 200 bucks for that. Now, you have a federal United States representative. That's 200 bucks. I didn't even do the math, but I know I'm probably over about 15 grand by now. I mean, by the time you go through everything. Here's the thing, though. If you wanted to buy that many NFA items, as many people as you voted on, it would cost you exactly the same amount. Wow. That's crazy. How's it going, Clover? How you doing, man? Um, I respectfully disagree because the states will also enforce that federal law and they will arrest you on it. So, yeah, I would say with that parallel, anybody you vote on would be 200 bucks because they will enforce it and your local city police will arrest you and the county sheriff will most likely arrest you. State police are around. They'll get in on it. So, you know what I'm saying? I still like my parallel. Now. Do you think most Americans even know that? That there's an enumerated right, meaning it's protected from the government. Huh. And you have to pay a $200 tax to exercise it. Now, for people that say, well, I don't like those types of guns. Why do you need? Why do you whatever? It's one of the weakest arguments ever. And it's actually a self-defeating argument. And I think it's actually okay once in a while to remind people of that, right? That would be like, for example, let's just pretend that you wanted NFA items. You wanted a machine gun, okay? You wanted a silencer, muffler, moderator, suppressor, okay? All right, you want that. But let's just say you don't want to vote, which is your right. You have the right to vote. You also have the right to not vote. You can be a completely productive member of society, or I guess you can be a POS. I would argue you really can't, though, because they talk about rights and they talk about duties in the Declaration of Independence. So according to the Founding Fathers, it's your right, it's your duty. And that actually does put it on you that you're supposed to do your best to be a good American and to help protect these natural rights. That's what the Founding Fathers said. But just to play devil's advocate, say you don't like to vote. Would that be fair for you to look at somebody, your friend that wants to still keep these items highly taxed and regulated to say, well, hold on a minute, though. I don't like to vote. So now you have to pay 200 bucks to vote. Have any of you guys even ever had any conversations like that? And I, I seriously just want to know. I'm not telling you guys you need to. It's just a suggestion, something to think about. But it's a conversation that I just don't hear come up very often. Maybe somebody likes to, I don't know, they like to walk around outside on their property, meaning they enjoy having property rights. Well, they're taxed for that like crazy. Just like we pay taxes on all firearms. Whether they're Title I, it could be a 22 long rifle, single shot. You're still paying sales tax on it. The gun dealer's paying tax. The middleman, the distributor's paying tax. There's still taxes on everything. I get that. I think taxation theft. That's something else for a whole nother day because we could talk two hours on that. But just look in and of just a very specific tax that's applied to it. And you're like, well, hold on. I want to walk from my house to my neighbor's house. And there's a federal government man just sitting there saying 200 bucks to walk over to your neighbor's house and talk to him on their deck. Well, that would sound ridiculous to most people because they're like, I have freedom of movement that's guaranteed by the founding fathers. 
Okay. You also have the right to keep and bear arms. That's equally guaranteed by the founding fathers. Seriously. The concept of taxing a fundamental, natural, God-given right that's enumerated and protected against the government is actually one of the most obscene and one of the most ridiculous things ever. In fact, it's, it's actually really, really insulting to the American people and to this country back then and still today that this bill would have ever been able to become law, that this bill would still prevail right now. To literally sit there and look at people and be like, well, hold on a minute. There's a specific prohibition against government, and we're just going to slap you in the face and put an additional tax on there? Wow. I think the Founding Fathers, one of the main reasons why they were starting to rebel, there were many things that all collided together. This was over many years that this revolution was gearing up, getting ready to go before it kicked off. Lexington and Concord, right? In Massachusetts. Now, it was about a 2% tax at that time. Right? 2%, 3%, depending what you read. Yeah, literally. And to remind somebody, let's look at noodles in here. Noodles. Now, here's the problem, noodles. This person here, they're a real beauty. They're a troll. They're going to end up, they won't be able to handle themselves in a minute, and they'll work their way out of here. But let's use them as an example here, okay? I'm going to make a, 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 an example out of you, Snoodles Noodles. Little cute little pink thing. Give me a break. The musket was slower to load than fill in the blank. This person probably doesn't even know about guns. But hold on, Noodles. You guys see Noodles in the chat? For those of you re-watching later that might not see this, there's someone named Noodles in the chat. They have this little pink thing as their avatar. Because I don't think they're going to last. They won't be able to handle themselves and talk to civilized people. But they're trolling right now saying, but a gun back then took longer to load. Okay, you're right. Now, with that said, now, not all guns, but you're thinking of the, you're thinking of the front line you know, firearm, which a lot of people had, because there were things that would literally, with one pull of a trigger, expel many projectiles. And there were things that were rather adjacent to machine guns during the time of the revolution. And that's true. But let's just assume I'm giving this person the benefit of the doubt because their argument is so weak, they wouldn't have a chance unless I help them. So I'm sure you'll thank me later. Noodles, I'm helping you out here. So let's assume you're talking about the musket. Okay. And it's slower to load than what we have now. Okay, that's probably true in some cases. But we still shoot muzzle loaders today, obviously. All right. That would also mean that during that same time period, you were to write with a quill pen, because that was the modern technology at the time. A quill, you dip it in an inkwell, and you write it on a piece of parchment paper. Now, here's the funny part. Noodles is going to say that at the founding of this country, you could have a musket and a muzzle loader. Now, okay, that's true. Now, they would also have to agree that you could only have a quill on a piece of paper back then. Now, they're going to fast forward them. This is what the other side does and say, but you can't have an AR-15 or an AK in today's times because it's so much different than that. And if you do, you should have to pay a $200 tax. Um, first of all, that's like completely makes no sense at all because the founding fathers knew about many technologies of firearms. I'm going to humor this argument and then destroy it even further, guys. I don't believe what I'm about to say, but I'm going to play devil's advocate against myself because this person argued against me so weak, I have to argue 90% against myself, and then they can join in and they're still going to lose. Okay, fine. Let's say that's true. And that means we should not be allowed to have a modern sporting rifle today. Well, then you're not allowed to type that garbage you just typed because they certainly wouldn't have known of YouTube and they certainly wouldn't have known a computer and they wouldn't have known as a keyboard. So I assume you're fine with a $200 tax. So for you to be allowed to exist, okay, you need to send the government a check for $200 for every single thing that you just typed in here. Now, here's the thing. I won't tell on you to have the government to collect the tax. You can just leave about $600 in super chats to me right now. And, hey, I'm not law enforcement. They still might bust you anyways. I'm violating your free speech, 
National Speech Act that I'm sure you would also have to advocate for. So you can just send $600 in super chats if you'd like, and I would appreciate it. Or you'd have to deal with the consequences of what you're advocating for. Saying, how, how do we even have any resistance left anymore, guys? There's people right now, the other side, because I don't know if Snoodles is even a person. I don't know what they identify as. I don't know what they, them, he, she is possibly thinking right now, or if they even exist at all. But whatever this other side truly is, their argument is seriously. In 1776, blah, 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 so nothing can change. As they're seriously sitting there on their computer or their iPad or their iPhone or their whatever the government's buying because they probably don't have a job. So whatever you're paying for to give them their government funded whatever that they're typing on. Some of these arguments are so stupid. Now, there's going to be a but here at the end, guys. We have to think about this. And I want you guys to provide me some knowledge. And help me think about this, because this is kind of like, whoa, like a black pill moment. Now, look, to defeat their argument on its face is so easy. There was a muzzle loader in 1776, and it's slower in stuff to load than a modern rifle. Okay? You can defeat it so easy. Like, literally, with what I just said. Oh, so you're not supposed to be able to fly on a plane because... Back then, you would have had to ride on horseback if you had enough money for a horse, if not just walk across the whole country. Look at people who went all the way across the country back then. Okay. People would, when they resettled parts of the United States, when they expanded on, look at the westward. Yeah, like the people with money would get to sit in the stagecoach and go on the horse, and all of the working class would have to walk. Hundreds of miles, thousands of miles. So that means this person shouldn't be able to drive a car and they shouldn't. And I'm not even talking about that troll. I already forgot their name. But here's something pretty heavy duty to think about. It's so easy to defeat their arguments like that quick. What the heck is wrong with all of us that believe what the founding documents say and believe in this experiment on self-government? Why are we losing? Because they literally make these arguments that have so many holes in them they couldn't even carry one drop of water. And anybody with two brain cells can defeat it in half a second. But actually, their way of thinking is still considered to be federal law. And if they believe you're violating it, we need to look no further than like obvious things that have happened in the past. You look at Waco. You look at Ruby Ridge. These were all around the National Firearms Act. You look at Matt Hoover and the current court case we're going to talk about in a little bit. That was around the national firearms act so somehow the people with the weakest arguments the most extreme views the most isolated views the views that are so far away from the mainstream that literally make zero sense you can defeat it in 10 seconds on one foot with your eyes closed in your sleep their side is actually still prevailing I mean, I mean, literally, it actually is. So I think what that means with us is we're probably sitting back too much. And look, I'm the same way as you guys. I just want to be left alone. But we literally must just be sitting there not actually letting people know what the truth is. Because for the National Firearms Act to even exist at all is just as preposterous as, well, this gun fires too fast. This gun's too quiet. It's too short. I don't know. Think about that. I have no idea how that's possible, but it is. I'm kind of glancing at the chat to see if anybody has any advice on this. And, um, yeah, seeing none. <laughs> how is it that these people are winning? Can anyone answer that? Maybe I just nailed it so much there's nothing more to add. I don't know. Is it just because nobody knows what's going on and nobody will even, like, talk about it? Are we all afraid of the left? Are we afraid of the other side? Hmm. They'll walk in there with their argument that is like a one on a scale of one through 100. 
and you can defeat them like nothing because you have the capability of being a 100 out of 100, let's just say. And somehow they still win? I don't know. JDV3 says, The left will just keep screaming and create change till it eventually happens. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. What's happening, Amanda? How you doing? What's up, Pillbox? Jeremy? Um, what was that that flashed up there, Linda? Thank you. JDV3 with another super chat. Thanks, man. He said, Fabric of American unraveled slowly and silently. It has been. And I'm excited about some court cases, but I'm going to be more excited once people actually can get this in the mainstream. Because, yeah. I think a lot of what he does is spot on. I think a lot of it is he just caters to his viewers to get as many views as possible. I'm going to call out both sides of it. But I do listen to a lot of Tim Pool's podcasts. And he said something earlier I was listening to. I was listening to it tonight. And um, yeah, he goes back and forth on certain issues. Again, primarily in my opinion, to see how many viewers he can get, how much money he can make. That's just in my opinion. But he does say a lot of stuff that I agree with too. And he was talking about, he said, can I live out in the country, he said. And there's a road that's posted 55 miles per hour, and everybody goes 70. Just everybody does. And therefore, since everybody's going 70, nobody really gets pulled over. And the one person that does, that the cops are making an example out of, they go into court, which has been an affirmative defense. It's been starting to be more and more established in case law. I don't really agree with case law, but that's what we have. The courts have decided to make it case law in a lot of jurisdictions, not like sweeping through the Supreme Court or anything, but they'll say, well, hold on a minute. That whole when the person says, but everyone else was going 70. And by me going 55 would have actually been a hazard and I could get rear-ended. So I was only speeding, going 15 over to be safer on the road. And courts have actually agreed with people in a number of cases that that was a you know good defense and they got off on the speeding ticket. And he was talking about some other topics, but he was basically saying, well, hold on a minute. Once there becomes a law in place and nobody follows it and nobody cares and they can't arrest everybody, and then you get off on it because everyone else is doing it anyways, it just kind of becomes like a suggestion. And it doesn't really have much force and effect anymore. What about the National Firearms Act? Now, I'm not advocating to break the law right now. I'm certainly not going to advocate that on YouTube, okay? But this is a hypothetical to think about. What would happen if everybody in the country that wanted one just had all the NFA items they wanted and said, tax, no, I believe in the founding documents. It doesn't matter anymore. And everybody just did what they did. They'd arrest the first one they caught. Then the second, the third, the 10th, the 100th. Would they arrest 100,000 people? Would they arrest a million people? Probably not, but I think everyone's so worried about being that first or second person. And ending up having been an example made out of them. Because the gun community is an interesting one. It really is. There's really no such thing as the gun community. But there are certain things that kind of pop up here and there. Now, you also have the Second Amendment community, which is a little bit different. It's adjacent to the gun community, but not necessarily the same one. Because there's people that love guns, love to consume reviews and gun videos. I can prove this, but hate the Second Amendment. Hate everything about it. So there's also the 2A community where there's people that love the Second Amendment. They love prohibitions on government. They believe in this experiment on self-governance, but they just don't happen to own any guns for whatever reason. So they're not the same thing, but we'll just say the Second Amendment community and the gun community has like this huge, huge appeal to authority. And they all like to say, but I'm law-abiding. Okay. And they consider to follow the law and to do all these things to be the most virtuous thing ever. And they generally do. And they wear that with the biggest badge of honor. That's their MO. That's what makes them a man or makes them a woman. Okay. And what do they do? They just keep passing more and more laws knowing that everybody's going to follow it, that it actually affects. Now the other side, I don't want to say it's just as simple as the left. You can say that, but it's many things that comprise the other side. They just say, no, we don't care if it's illegal to loot, steal, whatever. We'll just destroy the whole town. 
and they wind up literally getting statues built of somebody that was a drug dealer and held a gun to a pregnant woman's stomach and was counterfeiting money. And that person will literally get memorialized and idolized into statues as a deity, as some kind of like sovereign slash also religious figure almost. And that's just the reality of things. I'm Again, I'm not advocating that anyone breaks the law. I'm not saying that's a bad quality about you or anybody else. I'm just kind of telling you guys what actually is. And I think what they've been doing for a long time is using the gun community and the Second Amendment community's strength and turning it into a weakness. People will say, I will follow the law at all costs. And I think if you want to be a good American, you should follow the law, actually. You should literally follow the supreme law of the land to the T. Literally. I think what makes this country great is being a rule of law country. And what should be followed to the T, 100%. Okay? I'm being serious about this, very emphatically. What should be followed to the T, 100%, is the supreme law of the land. And there's only one supreme law of the land when it comes to firearms. It was only written down in the Constitution once. And it told you why and it told you what. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And I want to be of the utmost respect to that law. And I think everybody in this country should be bound to follow it. Literally, everybody within the government. Shall not be infringed. That's the law of the land. And I'm not telling you guys how to think, and I'm not advocating for you to do anything. I just wanted to bring this concept up to think about. I think it's worth thinking about, and it's something to talk about, okay? People literally pride themselves, and because I'm so law-abiding, I am going to follow 24,053 laws that all violate the supreme law of the land. And I think that's a lot of why we're here today. And I don't have an answer of how to fix it right now. I'm not telling anybody to do anything to fix it. I'm just being honest enough with you to say, I don't know why that is, but that is what it is. And I think I started a little bit earlier about the best way to start with this is just to let people be aware let more and more Americans know how absurd all of this is. And while they think that there's thousands and thousands of gun control laws, there's actually thousands and thousands and thousands of violations of the law. Shall not be infringed, like right there in plain English. Now, as soon as they want to say, but hold on, that's not the law of the land, then they've just defeated themselves as an American. Because now they also can't believe that their ability to exercise free speech or freedom of the press or the right to peaceably assemble or the right to petition their government for redress of grievance, they would have to also avoid that. And they would have to be totally fine with a soldier in their home because that's prohibited too. See, you can't just pick and choose and say, well, the Bill of Rights isn't the supreme law of the land when it comes to this one, but not those. It either is or it isn't. And there's methods to change the Constitution, and it's been changed Many, many times. But nothing's ever been amended in the Constitution that affects the Second Amendment whatsoever, actually. And I don't think people realize that. There is a method to change the supreme law of the land. And it can be done several ways. It's going to involve the states, the vast majority of the states. Look, that hasn't been done. Nothing's been done to repeal the Second Amendment or to replace it or to alter it. And I think where the conundrum we're in is people think that by violating the supreme law of the land as much as possible makes them of the utmost law abiding. Is that an interesting way to think about it? Hmm. I don't know. I don't see it talked about a lot like that. And look, you have to look at reality. Where are we today? How do we get here? Okay, that can get real depressing. But... As far as what's going on right now, I'm not here to depress you guys. I'm trying to offer just an insight of some thought, just to think about things, and actually to offer some encouragement, really. We have the courts, okay. We have the specific courts that are within the federal judiciary system. 
I think since so many people have this natural appeal to authority, people um, kind of revere those as the highest. I've just gotten done arguing for the last 40 minutes. I don't think they are. I think the court of public opinion is the highest court of, uh, uh, in this country. Because if we want to say we have a court of the people, by the people, for the people, and the only reason a government would exist at all is to protect our natural God-given rights, you have to put yourselves as the highest authority. But for some reason, people appear to somebody in a robe, somebody with a badge, somebody with an office, somebody sitting high on the hill with the name senator in front of them, a representative. It's just human nature. I get it. So people are going to appeal to the Supreme Court, to the federal court as this authority. And that's the only way that we can possibly get our country back. And yes, it's nice when we have a good Supreme Court decision that goes our way. I totally get that. But we simultaneously, at the very least, look, if we just look at it, it's black and it's white. That's too much culture shock for most people. I get the reality of that. It's not just going to happen. But I think simultaneously, while we're looking at these courts, the Supreme Court, all these federal courts, our job, what can we do? Because there's only nine people on the Supreme Court of the United States, and none of them are anybody watching right now. Right now, like I said earlier, <clears throat> we need to fight this fight and win in the court of public opinion. Because that's the only place that you have jurisprudence. See, they wouldn't even allow you to argue in front of the court because you don't have the proper licenses, do you? Maybe there's a couple of lawyers watching here, but you might not even, if you're a lawyer, you might not have the proper qualifications to argue in front of the federal court, whatever. Really, all you have is the court of public opinion. I don't think we should look at that. It's like, oh my gosh, that's all I have. No, no. I think that it was probably one of the most boring videos I've done because not really a lot of people watched it. But if you look at the if you look at the founding fathers when they wrote the Declaration of Independence, right? Not only did they say, like, this is what a government should be, this is how a government should be created. This is where I'll just kind of sum it up by saying this grand experiment on self-governance. The word experiment, grand experiment on self-governance isn't in there. But that's how I sum it up, and it makes sense for me, right? No. They said the people was on our side. The people are on our side. Providence is on our side is what they said. And they actually looked at we the people as being the defining force. They looked at the people, all the power being inherent in the people. They also looked at God and said God's on our side. Literally. People can take religion out of the founding of this country all they want, but facts don't care about your feelings. Now, here's the interesting thing. The First Amendment does protect your right to be an atheist, actually, that the government can't tread on that. But the colonists, the founding fathers, believed God was on their side. They believed providence was on their side, and they literally said so. They had the most two powerful things that they could ever have, and they knew it. And they knew they only had one chance, and they came in there. And they said, you know what? Uh-uh. Enough's enough. You know, they had actually started bloody battles and shots had been fired over a year earlier, right? Lexington conquered. That was 1775. The Revolutionary War didn't, like, start. The action of it didn't start. It started a full, full year earlier. It didn't start in 1776. And there have been skirmishes and many other things that had happened even years before that, no, they looked here and said, this is how a government is supposed to be formed. This is what a government should protect. And they literally established these are laws of nature and of nature's God. Literally, that's what this country was founded on. They never said, well, a man in a black robe will save you. They never said a policeman will save you. They never said... Your congressman will save you. No, they literally said, we need to do this or else. See, they were coming in. There was taxes. There were many things. They were getting taxation without representation. There's a long list of grievances. But they finally kicked off the Revolutionary War when they were coming to take their guns. Now they come. They take the guns. Okay. They take the guns. I mean, literally, they've taken so many people's guns. It's not even funny. And people say... They don't say it's the right 
right here. This isn't me saying this, Susan, or whoever else is listening from YouTube. This isn't me saying this. I'm reading the Declaration of Independence, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And then they go on after that to talk about why people will probably just deal with it. So literally, they're reduced to absolute despotism. But I would note, nowhere in there, when they said the government becomes tyrannical, what do you do? This was the blueprint of this country, by the way. These aren't my words. I'm not smart enough to have thought something like this out. I'm sure glad. <laughs> I'm sure glad a few of the founding fathers were able to get it together enough. But it doesn't say anywhere in the Declaration of Independence. A 5-4 majority of people wearing black robes will save you. It does it, actually. No, it doesn't. But that does appear that that's what most people are excited about. Is what the robes say goes. What the robes don't say goes. What your congressman says. What your senator says. What the president, or in this case, former vice president says. So there's this other case here. A lot of people are really excited about Bruin. And look, I don't want to, I didn't want to lose Bruin. That doesn't help the cause to sit there and lose a Supreme Court case. So don't misconstrue what I'm saying here. I'm just saying, yeah, you can root for United States Supreme Court victories, and that's great. I feel the courts are way more powerful now. I don't think they were supposed to be a third equal branch of government that was supposed to just write laws from the bench. In fact, I'm not saying that. The founding fathers said that, literally. But they are part, the judicial system is the part of this government. It's a third branch of government. It's not supposed to be writing laws, but it is supposed to look at things, whether that law is constitutional or not. Not supposed to make laws, but they're supposed to look and say, hmm, if it was a gun law that popped in front of them. This is what's interesting about this. And then I'm going to get on to the Supreme Court case a little bit. Because I get it. We're in a time now where most people do regard a Supreme Court case a lot higher than the founding documents. And I know a lot of people are probably already frustrated. I haven't talked about the Supreme Court case yet. I just wanted to remind you, though, while you sit there hopeless and helpless feeling, you're actually somebody who gets a vote in the court of public opinion. And I just literally just mean that to give you a little bit of encouragement. You can talk to people about what freedom is. You can talk to people about what the Second Amendment prohibits. Hint, it prohibits government from infringing, right? Obviously. But we're going to talk real quick about this Supreme Court case because it actually, it actually did change the edict of the lower courts, meaning they now have to look at the Bruin case. Bruin case versus New York Rifle and Pistol Association. It's a lot better or a lot less worse, however you want to look at it, than most recent court cases. And it's saying you have to look at the Second Amendment of what it says. And then you also have to look at the time period. I believe it's 1791 if it's a federal law, uh, 1868 if it's a state law, because that's when the 14th Amendment was ratified. That was the thinking of the majority decision penned by Clarence Thomas, signed on by four other justices. And they basically said, okay, was it considered an acceptable form of gun control in 1791? If so, the gun control law can stand. Now, this is federal we're talking about. Now, that's an interesting concept because the devil might be in the details of that. And this may be something that could have a whole avalanche of courts changing prior decisions. And here's why. Clarence Thomas was careful. He didn't say in there that there could be no gun control because the gun control laws of the land were zero in 1791, although he could have said that. And I kind of wish he would have said that, but as I was having a conversation with somebody earlier, maybe he couldn't have got four more justices to sign on to that concept. Now, I don't know if the courts are truly going to listen to the Bruin decision or not, but if you actually look at what it says, it says, by the time you get to the second part of the test, which was supposed to be where now the government can come in with a compelling interest. And that's where all the arguments used to happen in these gun cases. They say, yeah, 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 the right of the people to keep and bear them shall not be infringed. But we have to weigh that against the second question, which is, 
how much is this going to be a burden on the state? How much does the state need to protect people? Things like that. <clears throat> Clarence Thomas is pretty clear. He said, by the time you get to the second question, you've already asked one question too many. He's saying the only test in a Second Amendment related case is, was there a gun control law that was equal to or comparable to, okay, or comparable to 1791, which is when the Bill of Rights was written, right? Okay. In 1791, it was written, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And that was the law of the land, then, and we didn't have over 20,000 federal gun laws and regulations nullifying or getting rid of that. I'm saying nullifying in big air quotes because I believe the Constitution is still the supreme law of the land, but of course many people and most people in this country don't. And that's why we've allowed this to happen. So the way I'm hearing this now, now a lot of people are going to think, well, you're not a lawyer, you're not a judge. Yeah, I know. I'm nobody. I'm just part of we the people. And that's the problem. We've gotten into that way of thinking, okay? And I want you guys to realize you're not nobodies. Like, yeah, you're a grain of sand right now. But you get 100 million grains of sand, that literally becomes a mountain. So I want people to have the encouragement and realize what this country was founded on. And I'm looking at what Bruin actually said, and it said, okay, was there a similar gun control law in 1791? And the gun laws of 1791 were, shall not be infringed. And forever, all we've ever done to fight back, and this is why on this level there is some encouragement. We need to find encouragement in the court of public opinion, and if these court cases give you that encouragement, then they are actually a huge win. Because we're the only ones that can truly enforce these opinions. The lower courts, these other states, they're already trying to weasel work around what the Supreme Court said, okay? They're already weaseling around as much as they can. But now that they've said, well, for a gun law to be constitutional, it has to have been something that was enacted in 1791. And you have to look at what the Second Amendment says, and then you have to stop, and you actually can't even go any further than that. That's what Clarence Thomas said. By the time you're starting to ask that second question, we have two-part tests. What's happening, Freedom Inc.? I saw you mention something briefly about a second part, and in some cases with certain other unalienable rights, a third-part test. Well, when it comes to the Second Amendment-related issues, Clarence Thomas is saying, by the time you went to that second question, you've already gone one question too far. So does that leave the window open to repeal the National Firearms Act? Um. Maybe, actually. Remember, the court of public opinion is the only way we're going to win this. I don't want to keep repeating myself. I'm just trying to offer some motivation or encouragement. This country only fundamentally changes when the people are ready for it, too. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it will be until, I guess, the government gets so powerful that you're all locked up and confined in a little space where you can't even talk to each other. I know that's scary. We're still a ways away from that, but not as far as we'd like to be. Right? Okay. National Firearms Act not only put restrictions on Second Amendment protected rights, but also added a tax, like I was saying almost an hour ago now, added a $200 tax to exercise a constitutionally protected right, enumerated, meaning literally written down. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Oh, it drives you nuts. It's so simple. You guys are sitting there thinking, yeah, dude, like, I taught this to my third grader, and they were like, well, okay. I mean, you might have to teach them the word shall and infringed because they probably don't use those words at school anymore. But once you understand that shall is an edict, it's a direct order, it's a lawful order, think about that. You know how the cops will have you, and they'll say, show me what's in your pockets. And you're like, well, I don't consent to any searches and seizures. But due to the circumvention of your natural rights, this law in the state, blah, blah, hereby, therefore, too, I can go in your pockets anyways. And you'll see some of these auditors that do these YouTube videos say, is that a lawful order, officer? And then they'll say, yes, it is. Meaning if you don't listen to what they're requesting you to do at that point, you're going to get hogtied. It could get way worse. You're going to get locked in a box, in a cell, in a squad car. This is just what happens. Well, when they say, when the Founding Fathers wrote, shall not be infringed in 1791, that was a lawful order. Literally, an actual legit lawful order, unlike many of them now. 
which aren't legit whatsoever, but that's the definition of a lawful order. Okay, so that's what it says. Well, Thomas is saying now, and also he had the majority of justices sign on to this. They're saying, well, hold on. What does it say? Well, we know that. What comparable gun laws were around in 1791? Hearing nothing even remotely comparable to the National Firearms Act. You see where this could be heading? Hopefully heading? Look, we can take a win in the court and still call it a win. Now, Kavanaugh put some stuff in there that Roberts agreed with that made it milk toast, and they said, but a permit's still okay. It just has to be a shall issue instead of a may issue, and you're not allowed to have quite so many different tests. You don't have to prove why you need. So trust me, some of these, quote, conservative judges aren't that conservative. Apparently, with their Harvard and their Yale and their Ivy League, they can't read as well as I can. Because I would ask Kavanaugh, remember Kavanaugh? I drink beer. I like to drink beer. Scooter liked to drink beer. Skip liked to drink beer. I drank beer. I drank beer. Somebody spiked the punch? I don't know. Look, he was attacked ruthlessly during his confirmation. I didn't stand for that. But to say he sounded like a dumb twit would be the understatement to the word dumb twit. And I knew that about him then, and it's come true now. Is he less worse than whoever the former vice president has put on the court? Of course. So I know some of you guys are going to say that right now. I totally get it. But, Mr. I drank beer. Scooter drank beer. Whatever. All of his friends' nicknames. We drank beer. Someone spiked the punch. But I don't know. These people are all nuts. Trust me. All of them are nuts. Okay. So he somehow said that the way he reads the Second Amendment. Just think about this. The way Kavanaugh and Roberts and the three quote, liberals of the justice, even though they did sign on to Clarence Thomas's um, opinion. Thomas, I think, has it right. He, Him and Alito, in many cases, Gorsuch is actually kind of pleasantly surprising me for the most part. There's only a couple of these guys that might understand what the Constitution says. Because Kavanaugh has another beer. Remember, I drink beer. I'm Kav Kavanaugh had a few. And he looked down, and what he saw was, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to have a permit to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's what he obviously read. Hmm. I didn't read that there. That's what Kavanaugh read. Look, the case isn't perfect. The case was getting really close to being almost a perfect reading of, of what the Supreme Court should have decided, and then you had Kavanaugh being mealy mouth, and you had Roberts, and you had whatever. Okay. However, Clarence Thomas seemed to pretty much get it. And that brings us to the United States District Court, Middle District of Florida, Jacksonville Division. And this is the United States of America versus Matthew Raymond Hoover. And there was an interesting court filing that was just filed or filed a couple days ago, and I do actually want to talk about that. But before I do, did I have some chats I need to catch up on, Linda? A lot of people are very generous with those super chats, and I definitely want to read them while you guys are still in here because I appreciate it. A uh, member super chat. Part of the benefits of being a member is I think it's once a month or so you can put up what's the equivalency, the same size as a ten dollar super chat. They don't translate over here. So thank you, Linda, for taking the time to, to type it out so I can read it with this program. Um, from Ron Wayne, thanks for supporting the channel, man. He says, blessed to be part of this channel. Thanks, 2AEDU. Well, I'm blessed to be hanging out with you, man, you and your lovely wife and so many good people. So, so, so thank you. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate you, man. Um, Gregory Giovanni, nice to see you, dude. Nice to see you, man. I hope you're doing good. 1776 in Congress. July 4th, 1776. That's literally how it starts off. Man, one of the most beautiful things. Do you guys think I'm corny when I say that? I mean, I'm not going to apologize for saying it. I'm just being myself. In the United States of America, okay? Because if we go outside of that, I tend to think the Bible's quite a bit more beautiful. Just to be honest, that's my that's my sincerely held belief. 
but within within the last couple hundred years in the United States of America, has anyone seen anything more beautiful than this? Literally, it starts off. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. I mean, literally, think about this. All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Now, not limited to, but among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Most beautiful thing that I've ever seen a government write at all, actually. Thanks for the generous super chat. He says, haven't forgotten about you, brother. ATF to hell. Dude, I was hoping you were all right. You don't need to pay me money to say you didn't forget about me, by the way. Just say hi to me if you want. But I appreciate you supporting the channel, dude. I truly do. And while I can't keep up with all these streams while I'm live, I all these chats in the stream, I do come back and I do read all of them. And that's why I get the encouragement to keep coming back, guys. Um, Ron Wayne, channel member, and uh, another super chat. Thank you, man. He says, well spoken. Proud to be part of this channel. Well, well thanks, dude. And there's a 223 shout out for you. A piece of, is this wolf or Tula ammo? Tula ammo. Thanks, Ron. I appreciate it, ma'am. Marco Polo with a super chat. Thanks, dude. Look, I don't have a five, it's five, five, six in front of me right now without opening up a box. So pretend this is five, five, six, Marco. Thanks for the super chat and being a channel member. He says, NFA is a scam. It needs to go. Yeah, dude, I like the wording of that. It is a scam. It's literally like a Ponzi pyramid scam now that I think about it more. Hmm. What do you guys think? Is Marco on to something with that? Let's see here. Do you want to exercise a right that was endowed by your creator that the government is prohibited from infringing on? Okay. That the only reason the government would exist at all is to protect your natural rights. Check. Remember, that's part of this beautiful document here. And that the government has no rights. It can't have rights. All rights are inherent in the people, and the government would only have the authority that people would grant it. Now, don't convolute authorities or powers as rights. The government can have rights, literally. All rights are inherent in the people. Okay? The government only exists, and they talked about this in the Federalist Papers, and I've talked about this a ton before, when they had a, a little bit of a debate. They were debating and said, well, we should probably just shouldn't have any government at all. And they said, well, hold on a minute. If men were angels, we'd need no government at all. I'm paraphrasing, but go look it up, guys. Federalist Papers, I believe, 151. However, since men are not angels, we're going to need a government to protect these natural rights from tyrannical people and from other potential foreign tyrants, invaders, other countries. But the main reason, I believe, after reading it all in full context, was to protect us from ourselves. Okay. That's some of the basic, basic principles. I don't see how a $200 tax could even come close even like a little bit, even a scintilla of reference to exercise these rights. Like, no, it is a scam. It's not in the spirit of America. It didn't exist in 1791, so it shouldn't pass the Clarence Thomas test. And yeah, it's a scam. <laughs> Thanks, Marco. What's happening to the reptile, guys? How you doing, man? Speaking to someone out cutting grass. How's the business going, dude? He's in the lawn care type of trades like me. I hope it's doing good. Thanks for the super chat and being a channel member. And he says, you're my boy blue. I am wearing one of my blue shirts. Sometimes they're gray. Sometimes they're blue. And Nice avatar. What do you guys think? I think he has pretty good taste with that, with that hat he's wearing there. Hmm. Either he stole it from me, I stole it from him. or No, I actually copied off of him. I think I bought... My blue one first, then I bought the distressed one. So <laughs> thanks, Reptile guys. I hope your business is doing good, man. You're being safe out there working. Yes, it is a tax on a right, Cheeseburger said. Absolutely. Okay. If the NFA is repealed, um, yeah, that's the source of like all gun control. It would all fall. Now, look, actually, though, the Supreme Law of the Land says shall not be infringed. So by that, there can't be any gun control either, but there actually is. So, look, my simple answer would be all gun control would be gone. 
My more complicated answer is all gun control already isn't allowed to exist because of what the Supreme Law of the Land says. So I don't know what would happen. Probably if the NFA got repealed in real life, I'm just being blunt with you guys, not saying what they have the authority to do, not saying what they're allowed to do. Because remember, they need permission, not us. They need permission from us, okay, to delegate them any authority at all. And even if we do delegate them authority to tread on our rights, they're still not allowed to do it. That's what's so beautiful about these founding documents. If every last person said the government, tread on my natural right, they're still not allowed to because the Constitution and Bill of Rights doesn't allow them to. So with that said, that's the philosophical answer. Here's the cold, blunt truth. If the NFA got repealed, it would be a huge victory. We would celebrate, and then all the anti-gun states would double down and pass even more restrictive laws, actually. Because right now what they're doing when they got smacked down on Bruin, they're actually making it harder in some cases, it appears to me, to get a concealed carry permit than before by wordsmithing. In some cases, though, some of the more liberal, left, whatever states you want to call them, they did kind of come in there and acquiesce a little bit. So we might see some of both, actually, if the NFA got repealed. We might see some states agreeing. We might see some states saying, no, we're just going to double down. We don't care. Because here's the thing, the Supreme Court can't actually make anybody do anything. Actually, really, it can't. It can't make another branch of government do anything. The only authority the Supreme Court has or any of these branches of government have is the authority the people give them. So if there is a Supreme Court case and it says all gun control is unconstitutional and we will abolish all of it, unless the people are willing to stand up to that, it won't do anything at all except for just cause a bunch of talking heads on TV to argue about it and make a bunch of people a bunch of money who get paid to argue about stuff. So <laughs> that's an answer. You guys might not agree with me, but we, we see this happening. So this is a supplement to motion to dismiss, to declare unconstitutional the National Firearms Act of 1934. What precedent would this truly set in real life? I'm not exactly sure. But this is a court filing, which I do like. And then instead of playing defense like they always do, this is actually them going after and attacking the National Firearms Act. On paper, in a federal court, the Middle District of Florida, and this is in a case where the United States is versus a citizen, and that is um, Matthew Raymond Hoover otherwise known as CRS Firearms on YouTube. And this court briefing goes through, and it's nine pages long, which is kind of long in a way, but not nearly as long as a lot of different court briefings and opinions and whatnot. And they're going to go through here, and they're actually going to, I think these lawyers actually did a decent job of kind of starting to shred some of this apart. I'm going to read some of it here. I don't want to bore you guys and just keep reading for an hour, but it just starts off all formal. Defendant Matthew Raymond Hoover, in light of the Supreme Court's recent decision, okay, is attaching this motion. I'm skimming past that. And it says, in support of this motion, defendant hereby states the Supreme Court's landmark Bruin decision fundamentally changes the instant matter. I, I can see that argument because it actually does talk about, okay, it actually does talk about how all firearms related, Second Amendment, because these aren't just firearms. In this case, they're alleging it is under the National Firearms Act. But just remember, the right to keep and bear arms protects arms that aren't necessarily firearms, like knives and spears and hatchets and whatever, right? So I want to make that clear. But we're going to talk about firearms here because in this case, that's what's germane. A, the Bruin decision and its legal standard. Bruin held that as unconstitutional, New York's, Bruin held as unconstitutional, New York's 1911 Sullivan Act requiring a license and demonstration of proper cause for the possession and carrying of a concealable firearm. Okay. I think it's interesting that they talked about the year 1911 because the court did go back and unturn this New York Sullivan law from 1911. 1911 to 34, that's 23 years. And what they've been arguing for a long time, okay, in the courts is 
that once a law has been enacted just long enough, it becomes part of the history and tradition of the United States. Therefore, even if a law is unconstitutional and wrong, if it's unconstitutional long enough, it somehow becomes constitutional. Look, makes no sense to me either, obviously, but that has been what a lot of courts have been saying for a long time. They're kind of throwing that out there that in 1911, there was an unconstitutional gun control law that got thrown out. Okay. And by the way, I don't think that if the defendant, Mr. Hoover, wins in this, I think clearly he gets off on his charges, but I don't know what type of precedence this would set. It'd just be within this small district, Middle District of Florida, and then the circuit court could overrule it. No doubt, if, even if he did win in this district court, the feds would go and appeal to the circuit court of appeals, and then they would decide on it, and then that would have case law effect for that circuit, which includes several states in most instances. Not all, but in most instances, it's several states or jurisdictions. And then I guess they could appeal it up to the Supreme Court again, and then the Supreme Court would have to decide. So I don't really see, since the district courts are not normally a precedent-setting jurisdiction, I don't know what this truly does other than possibly, depending if there's appeals, get Mr. Hoover out of the charges that he is alleged, that are alleged against him, okay? Because he is innocent to proven guilty. Doesn't matter if you like him or not. That's the presumption of innocence that he has. And I hope everyone would hold dear if they love the Bill of Rights. So the presumed innocent in this case right now, that to have been alleged by the government to do these things, I think it lets him off. And that's assuming there's no appeals and he doesn't lose on appeal. So I just wanted to get that out of the way because somebody. But it's still nice to see in a federal court, they're starting to attack the NFA here because then it might be able to start moving up the ladder more and start attacking it where it could actually matter. Now, if the other side starts sitting there, the government just starts keeping, like, say, just say hypothetically he wanted the district and they appealed it to the circuit and he won there or even lost there. And then it got appealed by either party to the Supreme Court. And then there was a win there. Now it does have far reaching implications. I'm just trying to put this into perspective as it stands right now, a federal district court is not going to be binding over, I don't think, really much of anything. But it has the potential to be, depending how it gets escalated, also depending on how this might gain some steam for people to file these same arguments in other litigation and court cases. Hope I did a good job explaining that. I'm not a lawyer, and it's complicated to a point. Okay, so Bruin said this unconstitutional 1911, elect for, 1911 Act for Sullivan, okay, requiring a license and demonstrating proper cause for possession and carrying of a concealed firearm. Number two, what makes Bruin particularly germane to the instant matter is the announcement of a clear legal standard for the evaluation of acts regulating the peaceable keeping and bearing of arms. Um, yeah, that does make it germane. I don't know. I'm not trying to analyze this brief too much. I do question the wording of this. I'm just kind of, as I'm reading it here, Clear legal standard for evaluation of acts regulating the peaceable keeping and bearing of arms. I don't see anything about the right of the people to peaceably bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, the word peaceably assemble is in the First Amendment. I don't know if it's necessarily the author of this brief or if it's just something another court said. It seems like the First and Second Amendment got convoluted there because to peaceably assemble is written in the first amendment but there's the word peaceably peaceable or peace isn't anywhere in the second amendment at all but i guess i'm getting caught on a technicality i'll keep going bruin identified the court of appeals coalescing around a two-step framework for analyzing the second amendment i talked about that earlier the court identified as one step too many okay so they're talking about that And then it talks about how the previous decision at the various courts of appeal manifested deference to the government in a manner unlike any other fundamental right. And the inexplicable consideration of regulations clearly contemplating the keeping and bearing of arms as beyond the scope of the Second Amendment. And then they're talking about the different history. They also talk about reading case law to necessarily reflect intermediate, intermediate scrutiny in the Second Amendment context further um, 
positioning that a constitutional guarantee subject to future judges' assessment of its usefulness is no constitutional guarantee at all. And that's quoting Heller. Now, Heller also had some poison pills in it, too, which I've talked about before. Finally, though we have a standard which clearly articulates the burdens in a case involving restrictions on the right to keep and bear arms, it is, as artfully penned by the court, and then he puts in quotes, when the Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual's conduct, the Constitution presumptively protects that conduct. The government must then justify its regulation by demonstrating that it is not only consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearms regulation, only then may a court conclude that the individual's conduct falls outside the Second Amendment unqualified command. Okay. To summarize, any law, regulation, or government policy affecting the right of the people to keep and bear arms, U.S. Constitution, Amendment 2, can only be constitutional if the government demonstrates analogous restrictions deeply rooted in American history, evinced by historical materials, contemporaneous with the adoption of the Bill of Rights in 1791. And that's what I was talking about earlier, and that is also the what I had gleaned from reading the, the, the uh, majority decision that was penned by, by Clarence Thomas. So I agree with, let me tell you guys real quick who wrote this. This was written by Zachary Zerme Esquire and Matthew LaRossier, LaRossier Esquire. So these are the two lawyers that are defending Mr. Hoover that wrote this um, brief. And then they're going through talking about the different statutes. And I'm not going to read every word, but they're basically saying, look, first of all, they're saying an auto key card is not a machine gun. They're contesting that. They're saying it's not a machine gun. That's our argument. It was a piece of a lawful product that was just artwork, First Amendment protected speech. It was a conversation piece. That's how it was portrayed by many people when it came out. And it wasn't illegal at the time. So first of all, it's not an NFA item. I'm highly summarizing what's and the rest of this brief, guys. But I just want to get through it because I've already been on for over an hour and 20 minutes somehow. It's not a machine gun. It's not an NFA item. It's other protected speech. It's this, it's that, whatever. That's been the argument from the beginning with this. However, even though it's not a machine gun, if it were to somehow still be deemed a machine gun by the court, that would also be unconstitutional because the NFA is unconstitutional because you can only look at gun laws now with a one-part test. Was it written in 1791? What does the Second Amendment say? And the Second Amendment never said anything about banning a machine gun, taxing a machine gun, right? The Hughes Amendment of 1986 made it more of a ban, but it was a $200 tax restriction for quite some time in the intermediate, right? So there you go. Um, what's happening, Colin? Son, how you doing, man? Yeah, the NFA is a very long um, law, but I've attempted to talk about it a little bit before and talk about how unconstitutional it is because there shouldn't be. Look, it's two things. It's a two hundred dollar tax, okay? But it's also I'm saying it's two things besides just the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's obviously that, but it's another concept that we talk about a lot, and we need to talk more about. A right delayed is a right denied. That's why when they talk about these red flag laws saying, well, take the guns first, then due process. No, there's no due process left. Once you take something first before all of the due process of law, that again, right, this is protecting your rights to due process, not the government's. It's prohibitions on government. It's limits on government. It's restrictions on government. That's what the Constitution is. That's what the Bill of Rights is. Restricting the government so you may freely exercise your natural rights. Just like in red flag laws, there's no such thing as due process when you take first, then. It's more like take first and then never have due process. Okay, same thing here. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Did it say tomorrow, the next day, after a while? No. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. That meant right then. It meant every minute and second in between then till now, and it also means right now. Because to think the obverse of that would be completely and utterly ridiculous. So could you imagine bragging about the Second Amendment, right? And saying, 
well, necessary to the security of a free state in about six to 12 months. And then the founding fathers and the American people at that time sitting there saying, well, that's cool. Yeah, let's just live under tyranny and have some invader, foreigner, domestic, conquer us and strip us of everything for three to six months. And then after that, though, then we'll find it to be necessary to the security of a free state. Says no one with common sense and said nobody in 1776 and 1788. And nobody said it in 1791. At least none of the founding fathers did. No. Being necessary to the security of a free state meant right now and currently and in the future always. So not only is it a $200 tax, but it's a right delayed as a right denied. You don't have the right to keep and bear arms if you have to wait 6 to 12 months to get a postage stamp. This literally looks like a postage stamp, guys. I don't have any personally. I don't want to fund the people that are trying to do some of the most despicable things that's ever been done in the course of human events, but that's my personal opinion. Now, you have to wait 6 to 12 months in many cases or even longer for this postage stamp, stamp to come than only after you've paid, only after you've waited. Well, hold on a minute. I've said this a million times, and I think most of you agree. When seconds matter, police are only minutes away. That's why so many of you choose to arm yourselves. And when the police come, they're not even there to save you. They're actually usually there, in most cases, to write a report of what already happened. And sometimes due to politics and many things, they're told to stand down and not to respond at all. Okay? And we realize that. So how's that any different? When seconds matter, police are only minutes away. But now when it comes to an NFA item that you will find, look, it says right here. Laying its foundation in such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. It's up to you to decide what will provide for your safety and happiness. That's what the government was founded on. So if you need a machine gun for your safety and pursuit of happiness, if you need a rifle or shotgun with a certain length barrel, the founding father said that's up for you to decide, not the government. Now, Seconds matter, police are only minutes away, but an NFA tax stamp is only 6 to 12 months away? How could anybody with any leveled argument at all, any sane rationale, say that, oh, you still have the right to keep and bear arms? Really? After paying a tax and having to wait months or years? That doesn't sound like much that's going to suit what you feel is necessary for your security, does it? I don't think so. Take the guns first, and then due process is hyperbole. It cannot happen. And if someone tries to tell you it can, that's insulting to you because it requires a listener to be dumber than the speaker. Saying you have the right to keep and bear arms, but you have to pay a $200 tax and wait 6 to 12 months is probably equally as insulting. If you think about it, isn't it? Do any of you guys agree? Hmm. I think if enough Americans realize that, though, how unconstitutional all of it is, how much of an insult to their intelligence it is, might be able to get the momentum for the court of public opinion to say, no, that's enough. I'm done. Hmm. Now, don't forget, the Second Amendment was put in place to protect us against enemies foreign and domestic. And they were worried about Great Britain coming back because they did come back. You guys have heard of the War of 1812, right? Other conflicts. They knew Britain was coming back. But they also knew, if you look at the Tree of Liberty letter that was written, the Constitution was written, but it hadn't quite been published yet. Remember that famous letter about the Tree of Liberty that Thomas Jefferson wrote? And he couldn't believe it that more than a decade had already passed and there hadn't been any armed rebellion yet. And Thomas Jefferson said, not me, Susan, wiki, wiki. Thomas Jefferson said, let them take arms because he couldn't believe that it had actually gone that long. That there had been yet but one, not even one armed rebellion. That was Thomas Jefferson saying, look, guys, yeah, Great Britain's coming back. They're going to try to take us again. But the government's already here right now taking your rights. And he knew that. He knew that at that time. And that's why he wrote that letter. To give a warning to his friend that he was writing it to, but also to the American people. 
Hmm. Think about that. He was worried about the people that they hadn't stood up to the government yet. Now that even makes it more preposterous because the United States government does have a short barreled machine gun and it's called the M4. I know there's lots of talk about the future weapon systems, but let's talk in the here and now. Still the most prevalent firearm in the United States Armed Services, the US M4 assault rifle. That's actually literally what it's called, classified as. It's both a machine gun by the National Firearms Act and it's a short barrel rifle. Of course, that is what Thomas Jefferson would have said the people needed to stand up to a tyrannical government. If the tyrannical government has a machine gun, of course the people would need a machine gun. If they have a certain barrel length, you would have to have something similar. Wow. If they have tanks, then obviously Thomas Jefferson wanted you to have a tank. And it goes all the way up and down the ladder. And someone says, but hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. It couldn't possibly apply to like a battleship. Actually, yes, it would. Because civilians did own warships at the foundation of this country. And thankfully they did. Because the United States Navy couldn't even hold a candle compared to the British and their Navy. No, they did actually use what was called privateers and worked out a certain contract, a certain payment with them. And they fought on behalf of the colonists and the American Revolution with privately owned warships and cannons. Now, when are the American people going to realize and when is the judge going to come back and read the jury from the court of public opinion when the former vice president, let's go Brandon, politics is downstream from culture, seriously, let's go Brandon. He'll stand there. And tell the American people with a straight face, you weren't allowed to own a cannon in 1776. And he's wrong, and he's wrong, and he's wrong. And I could keep saying he's wrong until the end of this stream, and he would actually be no more or less wrong than he is, which is 100% unequivocally wrong. Yes, you could own a cannon. Yes, you could own a warship. Yes, the modern rifle, the Minuteman rifle, was a musket in 1776. And if the Brits would have had M4 machine guns, and we would have had the technology to make them. That's what we the people would have had in 1776. And that's what the founding fathers not only said it's your right, but it's your duty to have right now. That's my opinion. That's the plain reading of what the Declaration of Independence says. See, they had their muskets, actually. And they had their ammunition stockpiles. And that was one of the final things that kicked off the Revolutionary War because the Brits said, hold on a minute. We think we might smell a little bit of armed rebellion in the air. There might be an insurrection in the air. You guys have heard that word recently, right? See, nobody cares about what the Declaration of Independence says as evidenced by like the least but most, like literally the least popular video I've ever put up. I'm not complaining about my view count, guys. I'm just saying that's where America is right now. I did very good on some other videos last week. Thank you for watching. No. There might be some insurrectionists at foot. So the government come in, the boot of the government came in, and they were going to confiscate those arms in Massachusetts. And that was the direct result of what made the shot heard around the world kick off. We talk about Lexington Concord. I'm not a big historical person, but there were also other several other small cities right in the area. They said, no, you're not going to take our guns. Because, yeah, we are actually planning a rebellion. That's what they said to themselves. And if they take our guns, it ain't going to happen. This is our last chance. And they fought. They still try to negotiate with the King of England a little bit more. <laughs> and then they wrote that beautiful document in 1776. And they talked about the reasons that compelled them to their separation. And they talked about what it would mean to institute a new government and what that government would mean, didn't they? And when they wrote it, they said, not only are the people on our side, but providence is on our side. And then what did the king of England say? My friend Matteo and I were talking about this the other day. The king said, huh, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, nothing important happened today. Literally, nothing important happened today when he found out about this declaration and what the colonists were up to. The colonists had muskets. 
and other guns, not just muskets, but they were the most predominant, just like our United States Armed Services have many other firearms besides the M4. But I could talk about that for days and hours, and I don't have that much time left. So we'll stick to the musket and the M4. Here's something that's kind of ironic. And why does it make sense to you? I guess just because it's been the way it's been the whole time you've been alive. and But it's still worth thinking about. I'm going to explain a sharp contrast between then and now. Because we often talk about the sharp contrast of the amount of liberty that we can freely exercise in this country now, which is very, very little compared to what they could exercise in around the late 1700s, right? Well, here's another stark difference. Because, see, you think about things. Some things are causation. Some things are correlations. And it can be really, really easy to actually confuse correlations and causations. You guys tell me. I don't think this is a correlation as much as a causation when I'm about to say. We had more liberty. Free exercise of liberty. Not rights. You always had these rights. Before our government, during our government, even when our government's gone, the rights are there. They're unalienable. But I'm talking about liberties right now. You had more liberties in 1791 than you do today. Now, the modern service rifle was a musket at and around 1775, 1776, continuing even into 1791. And you were allowed to take that home with you. Your most state-of-the-art current weapon of war that was the preferred and most popular arm of the British Empire, the most popular you know, the most um, powerful country in the world. Shifting later into the 1700s, the United States was obviously becoming the most powerful country in the world. You could take your frontline service weapon home from that war, as the colonists, then American citizens did. And you could own that. You could have that. And you would still be equally as armed as the United States government. Now, if you go all the way up to, like, by the 19-teens, Okay, the government was introducing machine guns more prolific in the United States Armed Service, and you could still buy the same machine gun from a Sears catalog and get it shipped to your house in 1917, 1918. The people still had some parity, and they still even had less than what they did in the late, less than what they did in the late. 1700s, but they still had more exercise of liberty than they do now. Now, there were things like the Federal Reserve and many things that were started. It was going downhill really quick because they boiled the water so slowly back then. People didn't realize it was too hot. So it just kind of slowly and gently put them to sleep until they were dead. And once they realized they were dead, they were dead. So they couldn't jump out. That's the slow boiling effect of frogs. So all the way up until the National Firearms Act, you could literally... If you went into the United States Armed Services and you served your country with a particular firearm, regardless of what its barrel length was or rate of fire, you could purchase that as a civilian and you could arm yourself to protect your family, your country, yourself, your liberty, your posterity. You could protect all of that equally to what the person that might try to take it from you would have when they showed up to your door. It's just true, right? Let's go over a basic history lesson. Nowadays, we predominantly serve with the M4 rifle, chambered in 5.56. Can you just go to the store and buy an M4 rifle chambered in 5.56? No, you actually can't. And for that, you're a lot less free, and you have a lot less free exercise of liberty than you did then. But that's not enough either. They continued to pass gun control, bipartisan support that he just talked about here couple weeks ago on this channel. That's not even enough. They don't want to stop until they're literally all gone. That's why we need to be encouraged by these Supreme Court cases that can hopefully smack some of this down. We also need to be encouraged by the court of public opinion. And that's where you have a vote. Literally, you have a vote. There's unelected people with black robes. I get it. Elections have consequences. And the president does a point, And then they are confirmed. Right? Advise and consent, it's called. They're confirmed or denied by the United States Senate. So you have a third party way to kind of sort of vote your justices in. Okay. That's part of the American process. 
But when it comes to the court of public opinion, you have the ability to talk to somebody just as much as I do. I see my good friend Marksman TV. He has twice as many people that watch his channel, but our ability to talk to people is equal. And your ability is equal to talk to people as Marksman TVs, as Iraq veteran 8888s, as demolition ranches. Actually, it literally does. Now, they have a bigger platform. I get that. But the court of public opinion, not only is it the most powerful, but it should be the most encouraging. I think the Bruin case was good. Not perfect. I would have written it a lot better if I could have. But I couldn't do that. But what am I doing? I'm talking about our natural rights and trying to encourage you all as much as possible. Talk about where some of the levels of disparity are. Talk about how the founding fathers... Oh, they wanted disparity, all right. They wanted to be the disparity of force where the United States militia was so well regulated and so well armed that it was so much more powerful than the standing Navy of the United States, right, that they would not even think about messing with us. It's true. And now it's to the point where, well, would you even mess with the government? Because we've heard from different United States congressmen because they have nukes. We've also heard from the former vice president, you would need an F-14 and a nuke to take on the United States government. Oh, really? And that's how preposterous it is, as it is that you would need a $200 tax and have a right delayed, which is a right denied. You have no more. You have no right to own a National Firearms Act item. Are you kidding me? It's been relegated to a privilege. If you have to pay a tax and you have to be denied of that right, it's no longer a right anymore. A right delayed is always a right denied. And all of these modern weapons of war, which is the exact thing, literally the exact thing that the Constitution and Bill of Rights was there to protect, United States v. Miller, 1930 Supreme Court case, also said the Second Amendment actually protects weapons of war, and since the short-barreled shotgun that Mr. Miller had wasn't used in wartime by any military they were aware of, that wasn't protected because it was only a mere novelty. That only weapons of war were protected. That's what U.S. v. Miller said. That's what the United States Supreme Court said. Think about that. We went from the only thing that is protected is short barrel rifles and machine guns and grenade launchers and tanks and battleships. Remember, they had the equivalencies of all of those around the time of the revolution. The United States Supreme Court at one point said that is actually what you have the right. Wow. Think about that. To now we still have the National Firearms Act standing. We're getting close to 100 years, about 90 years. This has been standing. Let's hope we can get a chink in the armor in the United States court systems, okay? Bruin really helped hold the lower courts to a more strict standard of scrutiny. By the time they got to the second part of the test, they've already gone one step too far. That was very encouraging by Clarence Thomas, okay? So this brief that was just filed about saying the NFA is unconstitutional, I don't see any good for this country or for his family if he sits and rots in prison. So I hope this gets Mr. Hoover off. I don't know, again, like I said, that a district court precedent is potentially binding for much of anybody except for the literal defendant listed here. But it could be that little movement that starts. It gets other courts because even though it might not be binding precedent, certainly you can argue in another federal district to a judge and say, well, hold on, in U.S. v. Hoover, okay, this particular middle district of Florida, it still can be used by litigators to their advantage. So I don't want to say it's all or nothing, guys, because little things like this helps. Meanwhile, we're sitting there just chipping away in the court of public opinion. And I think when we can combine them together, that's probably our best chance. So I don't want you guys to get too black-pilled, because if you give up all hope, you have nothing at all. I'm trying to give you guys a couple things that are hope here. Let's make the court of public opinion that the National Firearms Act is just unconstitutional and they no longer have the consent of the governed for that law to be allowed to exist anymore. Do we all agree on that? We need them to realize that. Also, let's hope some of these things that are moving through the United States judicial system via the U.S. 
federal district court, the circuit court, the circuit court of appeals, all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States, we also need to take our wins there too. And when you combine them together, when you have an opinion that was written very strongly by Clarence Thomas, and then all of the gun and 2A people get behind it and believe in it, now we're starting to see some things actually starting to change. And that's how change happens. It just takes that little bit. And you just keep taking those little grains of sand and eventually you can turn them into a mountain. And now you're towering over the oppressor. See, we gave them away for too many years and they're towering over us. But there's that slight balance. And usually once stuff starts spreading, once stuff starts going down that slippery slope, it changes very, very rapidly. And I've talked many, many times about the slippery slope and a negative aspect. Look, here's the line I'm trying to walk here. We can't get cocky. And we can't say, look, let's just get cocky and say we won, put our heads in the sand. No, that's what our forefathers have done for a couple hundred years. That got us nowhere but 200, or I'm sorry, 24,000 gun control laws and regulations. Don't get cocky, guys. The fight's just beginning. However, that whole slippery slope can be used to our advantage, too. Once all these gun laws start falling and more and more people just come in and say, no, this is the direction this country needs to head. We're not going to let you turn this back around on us. The courts notice that. The courts feel they have the people behind them. Remember, that's literally what the founding fathers said. We're willing to write this, which could have been their death sentence if they lost, to the king of England. We have the people on our side and we have providence on our side. And then it can start spiraling down. It started spiraling down for the British pretty quickly then. They got momentum. Only 3% of the people were willing to start that revolutionary war to start this country, but then when all of the 97% that were apathetic started to notice them winning, more and more kept joining. Now, everyone didn't join them. There were some people that were made Tories, loyalists, till the very bitter end. Some people even moved back to Great Britain in disgust, but it was a lot more than 3% as things started to go by. And they set up a roadmap. So, hey, if we can take a Supreme Court victory, and look at it as a way for us to start talking about the good talk to people, spreading the good word, spreading knowledge about history, what the history of the United States really was. A lot of people don't know that's actually not weird at all for me to own a machine gun. Because if the founding fathers didn't own the direct equivalency, the most modern firearm of its time, we wouldn't be here right now. And I know I'm preaching the choir to a point, but I hope I'm not because I'm just reminding you guys, there's people you know right now. They're not necessarily stupid. They're not necessarily a commie. None of that. They just don't know. And there's some people that will literally still tell you in this day and age, really? You mean although we only had muskets back in 1776 or five or whatever, that's what the British had too. So therefore we actually had parity with the military. You'd be surprised, some of your friends and family that don't know that. Somehow the news has made them think that since the people nowadays don't have parity with the U.S. military, that the people never did. But they actually did. And all of these freedoms here that are protected by the United States government, at least back then they were and are still supposed to be today, yeah, that was made possible by people that were equally armed, if not more well-armed, than the most prominent military superpower of that time. Yes, the colonists had a lot of more heart. Yeah, they had a lot more soul. They had logistical advantages. They were fighting on their own turf, and I can't diminish any of that. But they also had equal competent arms of what the other side had. And I don't think a lot of people know that, and it is true. And if you look at the one-part test now of Bruin, it says, look at what gun laws were in 1791. You could actually own any gun you wanted in 1791. So therefore, it might take a little time, but if enough people believe that that's what it said and that's what it means, hopefully that will be the law of the land soon. Um, the law of the land is shall not be infringed, so if it infringes, it's an illegal law. What do you guys think of that? Something to look forward to. I'm not going to lie to you and say that's going to happen. I'm not saying it's going to happen right now. But if you want there a chance to be, you just need to keep fighting the good fight, okay? I'm not recommending anybody go out tomorrow and act according to these Supreme Court cases. It's going to take a little bit of time for these Supreme Court victories to go down through 
and actually change what the laws say. I get that. And it's really, really annoying because it says shall not be infringed like right now and we shouldn't have to wait. I know, I know. But it does make sense and we need to sit there and we don't want to be too patient. We don't want to lust on our laurels, but just to look at it is what it is. It took us like 240 years of realizing we were under absolute despotism when they wrote this document in 1776. And if it took 240 years for people to realize that and start fighting back, it might take a few years or decades or I don't know how long, but it might take some time to slowly get more and more of that chipped away. And that's not saying I'm content with that. We shouldn't have to wait to be able to exercise our rights at all. I'm just trying to be a realist and realize that that is, it's going to take a little time. But a lot of this stuff going on right now is certainly better than the opposite. It's better than that. So we'll take these little victories we can get in the Supreme Court of the United States. And then meanwhile, it's up to you guys. It's up to the American people whether we are going to win this culture war, whether we are going to win in the court of public opinion. I'm telling you right now, nobody cares about influencers anymore. Nobody cares about TV stars anymore. Nobody cares about, I mean, Hollywood's almost dead right now, guys. CNN tried to put on some online thing. They got less viewers than the 2A EDU channel does. You don't need to be somebody in government. Nobody, look, the United States Congress has like an 11% approval rating and stuff. The former vice president, all you can really say is, let's go Brandon. None of these people, like, people are just so dumb with all this. You know what that means, though, right? That should be super encouraging to all you nobodies, like me and you. Like, the nobodies nowadays, we are culture. We are the influencers. Nobody cares what Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman are doing and stuff. Do you guys remember that? I'm kind of dating myself. There was actually a time where people cared about what Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman had to say about something or, like, whatever. Like, there was a good Elvis movie, my wife said, that came out the other day. But other than like that, did is there even any movies being made? You guys get my point, right? The court of public opinion, you're part of that. And I'm noticing some vast culture shifts right now. People would actually just probably rather have conversations with you right now at this point in time, really. And that's pretty cool than to be sitting there listening to some person that I'm a movie star, I'm a sports star, I'm a congressman. <laughs> Right? <laughs> I mean that with the most utmost encouragement. Seriously, you, you're sitting there talking to someone, right? I want to talk to a United States congressman. To, I want to ask a movie star. Well, what movie is that? <laughs> Think about it. Somebody that hit so many home runs, whatever. They all use steroids anyways. Do they even? You guys get my point, right? Speaking of culture, if you're in the Michigan area, and this is what something I want to tell you guys about. We talked about it last year, and this is encouragement. If you're in the southeastern-ish Michigan area, in Fowlerville, Michigan, on the 16th, which is this Saturday, okay? I'm not talking about this out of the blue. This is actually the essence of what I've been talking about this whole night tonight. There's going to be an event. It's called 2A Days. Go check my YouTube community page. I'm also going to post it on Locals shortly. It gives you all the info, the link to the website. It's going to be awesome. Tons of my friends are going to be there. I hope to get to meet a lot of you guys. I'm going to be there too. My friend Jane Locke's going to be there. She's going to be doing the PA. A lot of you guys have known Jane. I think I saw her hanging out in the comments earlier. Hopefully she's still in here. Where are you at, darling? Jane, Jane Locke. I mean, seriously. Awesome woman. You might not believe me till you actually get to meet her. She's going to be there. She's going to be doing the PA stuff. She's actually being so darn generous. She's not only donating her time and services, she's going to donate her big PA system to the local 2A group so they can have, because there's physical logistics involved, so they can physically you know, amplify the, the speakers at the events. This is a place where you'll be able to actually meet people running for office and vet them out and walk up to them and shake their hand and say, will you support repealing the National Firearms Act if they're a federal, you know, candidate. And you'll, you'll get a chance to see what their answer is and if you believe them or not. I mean, this is how you participate. Now, I encourage all of you guys to come to this event. It's from 1 to 7 p.m., Fowlerville, Michigan, July 16th. Check my community page here on YouTube. 
and I hope you're there. Now, I have a lot of Michigan viewers, okay? But a lot of you aren't from Michigan, and I like all of you guys the same, although I obviously have some preference and bias towards the Michigan people. So shout out to all of you, but especially the Michigan people, because I like you all equally, but I like my Michigan people a little more. Totally fair, right? If you guys don't have one of these in Kansas where you're at, or in California, or New York, or Florida, and maybe you have it in your state but not in your town, all it takes is a few guys. I mean, my friend Rob, my friend Rick, Jane, people like that. My friend Rick Nieper, who's been my co-host before. He's often a regular in the chat on here. It just takes a couple people to get together and say, hey, do you guys want to have a meeting and start talking about this? Start talking about the Second Amendment? All right. Do you want to invite all of our friends and go and, and talk in someone's backyard about it? And then there you go. Politics is downstream from culture. We can sit there and talk fire and brimstone, and we should. And we can talk about encouragement, but then you have to have some fun once in a while. I hope you guys can figure out how to get events like this going in your areas where you can use this as a way to have fellowship, food, hangouts, things like that with your friends, talking about guns, talking about the Second Amendment. So some of you guys can experience grassroots politics where you can vet candidates right at the bare level where you can have a guy that's running for county commission in your area and you have a particular issue that's got your goat and you want to know if he's going to correct that or, or protect a certain right that's being denied in your area. There you go. That's what's called holding these people accountable. And there's a lot of that that goes on here and a lot of just hanging out with people, just talking about stuff. So if you're in the area, I'd love to see you in Fowlerville. If not, I would like to see you guys go and um, start your own thing up like this, right? So I encourage you guys all with that. I had some more super chats, Linda. And by the way, for all the channel supporters, make sure you check those posts, Patreon channel members um, over on Locals. I'm going to have a two-way EDU event not too far from Fowlerville. And that's going to be in Michigan too this fall, and I hope to see a ton of you guys there too. So, uh, Another member super chat. Thank you for being a channel supporter from St. Vicari. says, you inspire me and many others. Thank you, two-way EDU. Well, um, you're welcome, and thank you, man. I appreciate it. You guys inspire me too. There's a Clarence Thomas quote that's relative. He said, I'm sick and tired of the Second Amendment being treated as a second class right. And he said that in the past, and he said it in this brewing. He said the Second Amendment is not a second class right. Bill Camperis, what's happening, man? How you doing? 762. All right. 54R, X39, both good cartridges. Shout out to the 762. He was probably thinking 762 by 51 NATO. No, he wasn't. 762 by 39. He said freedom. Well, thank you for the super chat, man, and for all of your encouragement. And you've been very generous for the channel, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Warthog 71. What's happening, dude? Thanks for the generous super chat. And shout out to the Warthog 71 channel. He's a good dude. He does his thing over there. Make sure you guys check him out. He's a good guy. Good luck with the channel, man. He says, next, after the SCOTUS EPA decision, Chevron deference needs to be abolished. Yes, 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 big time. This removes the teeth from all letter agencies and will force them to follow the law as written, not administratively interpreted. Dude, you know this, and I know that's why you put this up, and I'm glad you did for the people to get some encouragement and think about this. We'll see how this propagates, right? The West Virginia case with the EPA. <coughs> Look, I don't want to be patient. We shouldn't have to be, but we just got to give it a little time. It took us 240 years of despotism and people not caring to get here, right? We're wrong. Look, I know you cared when you served your country, and I know pretty much everyone watching cares, but there's a lot of people out there that didn't care for a really long time. Let's hope this can propagate. Get rid of that Chevron deference. Jeez, oh, Pete. I don't have time to talk about it now, but it's been well discussed here before. I think you guys know I'm not a fan. Angry Fat Boy, 1776 with a super chat. Thanks, man. And, and a channel member. Thank you, dude. I appreciate it. Says, evening, Patriots. I think that we the people, that would be you guys when he says that, right? That's all of you. Giving you guys some encouragement here to the people. He says, I think that we the people will win in the end. God bless America and everyone that stands with us. 
Keep up the good fight. We will win. Dude, thank you for the encouragement. And that's what my whole stream tonight was about. We have to address the problems. I know sometimes my streams will seem like they're getting dark for a few minutes. We have to know what the problem is before we can fix it. Right, Angry? Dude, we, we, we have to win, guys. If we can't win, look, we don't want our kids and our children's children and children's children's children to have to live in a thousand years of darkness. We lose this experiment on self-governance. We ain't ever, ever getting it back. Literally, not in our lifetime. You'll never be able to see it. We have to win at all costs. And there's a lot of people that are on our side, aren't there? Aren't there angry? A lot of people. And I understand just by what your name says, you're angry about what's going on in this country. Of course you are. A lot of you guys are angry and you have every right to be. But you need to remember, there's a lot of really, really good people who are on your side. And Providence is on your side. And that's what the founding fathers knew. And you guys need to know that too. Court of public opinion, the Supreme Court. Hey, let's see here what's going to happen, guys. I'm trying to stay motivated and stay energized. Flood, music, flood munitions with the super chat. Five, four, five, which is an excellent round. And do I not have any five, four, five handy right now? What's wrong with me? Huge AK-74 guy. It's literally like 15 feet that way. Says, thanks for sharing all this knowledge, 2AE to you. You have inspired me to start my own channel in hopes of encouraging others to start down the 2A path. Well, thanks for letting me know, man. I'll have to check it out later, and good luck with your channel. Um, Like I said, dude, I'm nobody. If you're a nobody, that means you're even, like, way more influential. So do what you can. Fight the good fight. There's something you're going to say that will hopefully help somebody that I could have never thought to say, and maybe vice versa, and we'll just all work together. And, yeah, keep the culture alive, man. Keep up the good fight, and... And good luck with that channel. I know. Where's the 545 at? Next time for sure. Look, we're on YouTube. There could be a theoretical Susan. Susan Wiki Wiki. She's a real beauty. There could be a theoretical Bulgarian AK-74. It's not within reach right now, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but, yeah, I can only keep so many types of ammo right here because I start off with them here, and then they fall down off of the desk and end up on the floor. So, you know. All right. Well, thank you for such generous super chats. Um, I am going to be over there on Locals doing a stream tomorrow night. So if you guys aren't tired of me yet. And also, my friend Mateo and I are starting the 2A EDU podcast. So look for an episode, hopefully, unless there's a technical glitch. Because I'm new at, like, physically knowing how to do it. We should have a podcast posted for you guys starting on Locals. And then I'll figure out how to propagate it to like iTunes and the podcatchers and whatever. But we are getting ready to release our first episode of the 2A EDU podcast. So hopefully you guys are looking forward to that. I know we are. And just something else for you guys to listen to and hang out while you're working or, or whatever. I know a lot of you guys listen to these live streams as a podcast. And I appreciate all of you who are live right now. And all of you come back later. A podcast is a little different where it's one or two people just talking and there isn't any kind of chat, which is awesome here. Some people like to just listen to an hour in the audio podcast form. And yeah, I have plenty of things that I want to talk about and we are going to do that and see what you guys think. If you guys like it, we'll keep doing it. If you don't, I don't know. We might keep doing it. We might not. Right. Band talk. What's happening, man? How are you doing? Yep, accuse your enemy of your own actions. It's the art of war. Is it ever? And I see what's happening, dude. Shout out to the Band Talk channel, another one of my favorites. I don't have time to watch too much YouTube, to be honest, guys. There's only a couple channels I watch. And, um, yeah, just to go by what I was earlier, Band Talk has probably less subs, quite frankly, than almost any channel that I've heard of. Right, Band Talk? But it's been growing a lot, actually, and I put that on my list. And if I can't catch his shows live, I make sure I've listened to him before his next show comes on. So that's exactly what I'm talking about. Different people that have different influences, and he's definitely been a um, source of motivation and content for me. So I thank you for that, Band Talk. I appreciate your content and just your perspectives and you know, the help that it gives me to sit and think about things in a little different way sometimes. 
Um, the unknown user from Southeast PA is offering some encouragement. It says, love your loyal country, man. Obey God and be a tough, bad ASS. And I don't swear on this channel because of the children that watch, but I get exactly what you're saying there. What's happening, Denny's plant-based journey? I saw a band talk talking to Denny, and I'm like, where's Denny at? Denny's a good dude. Look at all these good people. Warthog, there he is. Ron Wayne, what's happening, Ron Wayne? Thanks, man. Mike McLuhan, another good one. What's happening, dude? How you doing, man? What's happening, James Kawasaki? He's agreeing with unknown user. There's JJ Rainey. Are we going to hang out this fall, JJ? I think so. I hope you're doing good, dude. Well, oh, here's the thing, Morningstar. Um, <laughs> I envy you. He says, watching live streams is a part-time job that you don't get paid for. Yes. Putting out content on this platform can be your most expensive hobby, which is actually harder to accomplish than working for free. But we're able to keep this going because a lot of people who watch are very generous. What's happening, Ross77? New channel member, longtime supporter. I saw you just join. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Here's another Michigan man, Rudy Fenny. What's happening, Rudy? How you doing, dude? I just want to say hi to a couple more people. There's Bill giving Band Talk a little shout out. Yeah, dude, I know. Flood Munitions drives a lot. I hear you, man. I, I drive and then I'm on that lawnmower a lot. I'm like, dude, would someone else put out a quality podcast, please? I've got eight hours worth of work to do, and it's like you just can't keep up with all of it. Right, Colin, son? What's happening, man? <laughs> Mark Rosen, what's up, Mark? EV3 Dale, how's it going? What's happening, Dale? Pillbox Bunker, there he is. What's happening, man? You keeping the bunker fortified? I don't even need to ask him that. You know he's keeping the bunker fortified. What's up, Pillbox? What's happening, Gort? How you doing, man? If I'm boring some of you guys, sorry about your luck. I just want to say hi to a few of my friends on the way out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there's Jane Locke. She's in here. What's happening, Jane? Oh, Jane's a pretty cool chick, you know? I'm looking forward to seeing you in about a week or so, and then we'll probably see you again later on this fall. Yeah, I didn't even need Pellbox to answer, but there you go. If you guys don't believe me, he said, you bet that bunker's fortified. Of course it is. There she is. I said hi to Ron. Now I'll say hi to the better half. What's happening? Misty, Mrs. Wayne, wishing everybody a good and safe night and weekend. I hope you have a good weekend, too. AK or AR. Come on, man. You got to check the channel out. Okay. You might be new here. Everybody has to be new once. I think he's just asking the chat. But Rich Homie Ghost. Dude, AK guy. Like, literally. I mean, look at, like, and stuff, right? I like the AR too, but if you make me pick one or the other, a gay guy. Um, ADXR920, thanks for being a channel supporter. And with what he's um, advocating for, I don't want to destroy my view duration, but thank you for the encouragement. <laughs> now, you guys do you. When you watch stuff double speed, it eh, messes with the algorithms, which that's all YouTube is, is literally just an algorithm. So I can't advocate for that, but thanks for being a channel supporter. Um, Dolly Madison's dad said, new member, love the channel. Well, thank you. What's happening? Look at that. That's a neat. <laughs> Look at those droopy ears. Nice looking puppy there. Nice looking dog. Thank you, Dolly Madison's dad. I, I, I saw the snowman at first and I'm like, oh, that's cute. <laughs> when you look at those droopy ears, you can't help but to say that. What's happening, Lori? How's it going? Why do you use that pen name? Come on, man. Ugh. Are you being on the down low, or can I say hi to you by who you really are? I don't know. Lori Dickin, going by the... Some of you guys do that, don't you? Use these incognito names on here. I'll tell you what, the Jackal's pretty nice. Look, it's too late for an AR, uh, AK debate right now. Trust me. The Jackal was smooth, Okay. <laughs> I 
Okay, I was talking about Rick Nieper here earlier. That's Rick using a alias. What's happening, Rick? How you doing? Jane, I will be there later than 9. If anyone's coming earlier around 9 to Fowlerville, look up Jane. And she could use help carrying 8 to 10 speakers at 90 pounds each. Two amplifier racks at 150 pounds each. So, yeah. Misty said that's the puppy that Ron wants. No, it's, it's a cute dog. It really is. All right. People are all talking about machine guns. I'm not going to say too much, but we're going to have a fun event in November. Make sure you guys check for those posts. I'll just say that. All right, guys. No AR, AK debate. It's way too late, but I did enjoy hanging out with all of you tonight. And are we all caught up on chats, Linda? Because I need to get out of here, if so. Because... If I let this go into a full AR, AK debate this late at night, you know where these things can head, right? We did have a full stream on here before talking about the AR and AK, and yeah, it's too late for that. So, since Ultra Maga Mama Linda, the most beautiful girl in here, and my favorite, by the way, too, just to let you guys know. I mean, I meant all the shout outs for all of you guys tonight. But literally the number one shout out goes to her. Thank you for all you do to allow this channel to be possible. And I've got to get out of here because we can't have an AR, AK debate. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. And have a good one. And see you on Locals tomorrow.